We are going to do a service a little bit different today. We're going to try to speedily get through this service so that we can make it home safely as we know the storm is hitting us. So uh, if you can, I'll, I'll let you get to your seats. Um, we're just going to go ahead and bow in prayer. Dear Lord, we're, we're thankful to be here. We're thankful that we have so many of us ready to worship you. So many of us that are ready and willing to go out and, and be here. We pray for all those that haven't traveled here, Lord, that, that ultimately everyone today can be safe, that all those traveling and not traveling stay safe today. And we pray that today we can open our hearts, open our minds to really worship you. We're thankful to be here and we pray that we can fix our eyes on you. So in your son's name we pray, amen. All right, if you can stand and sing with me. Father, we love you. We worship and adore you. Glorify thy name in all the earth. Glorify thy name, glorify thy name, glorify thy name in all the earth. Jesus, we love you, we worship and adore you. Glorify thy name in all the earth. Glorify thy name. Glorify thy name. Glorify thy name in all the earth. Spirit, we love you, we worship and adore you. Glorify thy name in all the earth. Glorify thy name. Glorify thy name, glorify thy name in all the earth. Glorify thy name, glorify thy name, glorify thy name in all the earth. Thank you for the bass, Chris. This week, and it was focused on the difference between optimism and hope. And when you look at it in a secular way, um, optimism is a belief that generally things are going to go better than they, they than better than I guess good. They're not going to go bad. You're going to have a, a positive outlook. Um, and hope focuses on the identification and the attainment of specific goals to to to, to, to achieve a detailed outcome. So when you look at um, the Bible, there's messages uh, um, focused on hope throughout the scriptures and um, in Jeremiah uh, chapter 29 verse 11 uh, it says for I know the plans I have for you declares the Lord plans to, pro to prosper you and not to harm you plans to give you hope and a future plans to give you hope and a future we have hope because God had a plan for us and that plan, we get together every Sunday, and we focus this time on that plan, that plan of salvation. And that's what gives us hope. Hope is not something that lasts forever. Hope 
is something that is temporary. It is the uh, gift from God. It's the food that God gives us to sustain us to where we want to be. And one day, we will attain that and we will no longer need hope because we have reached what we've been hoping for all of our lives. And so this morning, as we, uh, as we take, uh, if everyone has, uh, has their uh, bread and their cup, uh, as we take uh, the communion, uh, we'll take the bread now, let's, uh, let's be thankful for the hope that God gives us and allows us to, uh, to sustain us um, until we reach uh, heaven with Him. Let's pray. Father God, we're so thankful for Your plan of salvation. Lord, You knew... Uh, that that plan was necessary before you created the earth. And we are so thankful uh, for your wisdom, for your, for your uh, uh, foresight, and knowing that we, were, we would fall short, and yet you loved us so much that you, you created a plan of salvation. And we're thankful for that hope that we have now. And as we take this bread, help us to recognize that one day we won't need that hope because we will be there with you uh, for eternity. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's continue our prayer. Father God, we're so thankful for the, the uh, fruit of the vine that we're about to take. We're thankful for uh, the blood that was shed. Oftentimes we focus on the sacrifice that was made, but we, we forget about the love that was displayed by Jesus. He wasn't murdered. He willfully gave his life for us, and we're so thankful for that, and we're thankful for the hope that we have because of that. And for, uh, we look forward to the day that we, uh, we can join you in heaven. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I think most of you already know, uh, we typically... Um, uh, give it a time for uh, folks to give back a portion of their financial blessings to help further uh, our work um, to bring others to Christ. Um, obviously, there's a plate in the back if you if you uh, have the desire and the ability to, to give back to to the church, work of the church here. You'll have that ability as you leave the building, or if you have an interest in doing it online, just uh, holler at somebody. I'm sure that in the office where I'm ha I'm happy to help at least point you in the right direction. Um, let's give thanks for uh, our blessing. Father God, we're so thankful for all the ways that you bless us. We're thankful for our church family here. We're thankful for uh, just the warmth that we have in our homes, the coats as we prepare for bad weather, uh, just you, uh, the food that we eat, just all the ways that you anticipate our needs and provide for them, even in ways that are, we, are better than we could have asked for. And we, we just... Uh, I want to pray as, as we um, think about uh, the ability to give back. We're thankful that we're blessed in a way that we can give back, that we can uh, use our, our finances to reach others and to bring others to Christ. And we just pray that we use uh, the funds that are collected here wisely and in a way that you would uh, be pleased. And uh, in St. Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today we talked about not doing Sunday school. I'm so sorry. <laughs> As Virginia gets up, she's like, I'm out. Um, but uh, because of the weather, we're going to... Oh, psych! You guys have Sunday school. <laughs> Thank you so much, Renee, for this very well-planned and executed strategy we implemented today. <laughs> uh, if you, you can stand and sing with me. <laughs> Oh, don't you love it? Um, yeah, salvation belongs to our God, so let's worship together in song. Salvation belongs to our God who sits upon the throne and unto the Lamb be praise and glory, wisdom and thanks. 
honor and power and strength be and ever be to our God forever and ever be to our God forever and ever amen and we the redeemed shall be strong in purpose and in unity declaring aloud praise and glory wisdom and thanks honor and power and strength be to our god forever and ever be to our god forever and ever be to our god forever and ever amen be to our god forever and ever be to our god forever and ever be to our god forever and ever amen be to our god forever and ever be to our god forever and ever be to our god forever and ever amen may be seated least hopefully maybe more uh 10 or 11 weeks and so uh we're thankful for him being here making the trek down from parkersburg and uh so i i think everyone's met steve but if not take 30 seconds no more after church and say hi and introduce yourself to him steve I was starting off here is to talk a little bit about preaching and the reason why I do that is because um, I, I don't view it as just a, a, a monologue. Now, I know it's always done as a monologue, at least in our Western society or the way we do it as Americans, we do it as a monologue, but it is very much a dialogue and certainly in uh, scripture we can see that the responsibility of the listener is there as much as, as the responsibility of the speaker. I don't know, that might be a little bit of exaggeration to say that they're the same, but, but it's there, and it's something that I really want us to think about today. So I want to just very briefly, uh, quickly, maybe not briefly, but uh, quickly I want to talk about a text, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Uh, I would read a, a portion of that, and then what I want to do from there is talk about uh, kind of with this idea of dialogue, kind of say like, here's what I'm trying to do on my side of it, uh, here's what I suggest for audience members. And, uh, and, and to close with uh, the, the work of the Holy Spirit in this particular uh, moment of time. Um, I, 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 feel, I feel good about talking about these sorts of things because I've been in all parts of it. You know, I've, I've, I've been an audience member um, a lot, especially since I, I left um, preaching and uh, went to teach at Ohio Valley, you know, I, ha I haven't been preaching. And so as an audience member, I, I have that, the, these are some of the things that I think about as a person who is listening. Okay, so let me just start, 1 Corinthians 2, uh, I may not read the whole thing, I was going to read uh, the whole chapter, but uh, this is Paul talking to the church at Corinth, when I came to you brothers, I did not come proclaiming the testimony of God in lofty words or wisdom, I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. 
And I was with you in weakness and in much fear and trembling, and my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And as we keep going down through here, he talks about there's things you can give to mature people and there's things that you can't. And then he starts talking about that God reveals things through the spirit. The spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For what person knows a man's thought except the spirit of the man which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. Now we've received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is from God, that we might understand the gifts bestowed on us by God. And we impart these in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who possess the spirit. Okay, so just in terms of, uh, you know, sort of framing the text here, one way of reading what Paul is talking about here is that he's talking about just like writing scripture. And so this, the Spirit gives us these things, and we write these things, and then people, whenever they read them, the Spirit is the one that actually interprets those things. But if you look at the context of this, there's no reason to think that he's having sort of that cramped of a view. He's talking about speaking. And in fact, the, the whole context of this is talking about how I spoke to you when I was here before. And so I, I would urge that uh, this is not a text about the inspiration of Scripture, but that this is a text about what happens in preaching. Uh, this is a text of, about what happens in proclamation, that it is uh, th th this presentation of Jesus and him crucified and a presentation where the, uh, the deeper parts of myself are known by myself, my spirit, as he puts it, and the deeper parts of God are known by his spirit and that there's a communication there uh, spirit to spirit. There's a communication there from my spirit to God's spirit. I know that may sound very mystical and scary to some folks, but hang in there. Uh, hang in there, okay? I'm going to circle back to it. I want to start, first of all, with what I'm trying to do uh, when I'm up here. I'm very convinced about Paul's words in Ephesians chapter 4 that uh, we ought to be equipping one another, and that's what I view this as. This is equipping adult believers. You know, I love having kids with me, but um, for the most part, I talk to adults. So adult believers, uh, people who can then teach other people, that would be my goal, is that you could hear something that you could um, perhaps be able to teach somebody else. And I want to be aware, though, of outsiders. Um, Paul talks about being all things to all people that I might by all means win some. Uh, that's in 1 Corinthians 9. And so we all things to all people that I might by all means win some. That attitude is different than an attitude that I was kind of raised with where we were afraid to do anything for fear that a visitor from another church would come by, the, uh, especially the, the, the much vaunted Sunday night visitor, that, uh, that if they came and saw something that was different than what they were used to. But see, that's not our focus. Our focus shouldn't be on whether somebody who comes in with a critical eye might have some criticism of something we're doing. The focus is the unreached. The focus is being all things to all people that we might by all means reach some. And so that, that exaggerated language that, that Paul uses there in 1 Corinthians 9, that's, that's not the language of people who are um, afraid that they're going to offend somebody or, or afraid that something's going to sound a little discordant or uh, look a little different than what it's looked like before. That's not that language. That's a language that says, you know, we're, we're launching. You know, we're, we're, we're after uh, people. We're wanting to reach people. So um, always aware of the impact on outsiders. In fact, in this whole discussion that takes place in Corinthians, maybe sometime we'll, we'll be able to spend some more focused time on Corinthians. But in that whole discussion, which talks a whole lot about what you do in your assemblies and how you eat or don't eat meats and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You'll see that the focus is that I want the people who come into your assemblies to say, truly God is among them. That's, that's what I want them to say. I don't want them to come in and say, man, I'm not connecting with anything they're doing at all, or they are just so weird, or they're doing things that jar me as a Corinthian resident to where I can't hear the gospel. I just can't hear it because of their weird Jewish ways. And it's exactly the context where Paul says, I become all things to all people that I might by all means win some. And so he's different in Jerusalem than he is in Corinth. And so we, we also, we, we live in context. And this context, immediate context, Kanawha County. 
Uh, that's our immediate context. And so we want to be uh, aware of people without being like completely market driven. Also, uh, I really try to encourage a, a mature faith, which means that sometimes you raise questions without answering them. Sometimes you will allow uh, a struggle to take place. Uh, Jesus does this. In John chapter 6, he says, if you don't eat my flesh, if you don't drink my blood, then you don't have any life. My flesh is real food. My blood is real drink. And it says that the people began to flock away from him. They, they completely left. Jesus uh, doesn't know how to keep an audience, apparently. They just ran away. But look at what Jesus does at the end of that chapter. All that he does is he turns to his disciples and say, how about you? Do you also want to go? So it's, it's not like, you know, I think a lot of times what we would do is we would sort of dumb down that, that message and make it to where no one would possibly be offended by that message. And if they were, we'd catch them at the door, say, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm talking figuratively. I'm talking about the Lord's Supper. You know, I'm talking about a little piece of bread. Don't, don't. But Jesus doesn't do that. He says, my flesh, my blood, and he lets them go. Why? Because they need to go through this process of thinking about what he's saying. And this is not the last time he's going to talk to them. But at this particular time, that's the effect that perhaps needs to happen. And so Peter doesn't even give him a rounding, a, a real ringing endorsement. I don't hear it as a ringing endorsement. Peter says, where else should we go? You're the one that has the words of eternal life. I think at that point, what Peter's kind of saying is, not loving what you're presenting today, Jesus, but I still know who you are, and so I'm going to stay here with you. We're going to stay with you, uh, despite this one that perhaps didn't really hit us square either. You know, we're, we're, we're not into uh, cannibalism. And that's a way that people would often understand Jesus. But you see, he, he, a lot, he raised that question. He put them in that uncomfortable spot, and he left them there, which I think is, is something that, uh, that we need to do um, in, in our educational uh, work and in our, in our pulpit work. Uh, too many times, we're facing university-level skepticism with Sunday school-level faith. And the reason why faith loses there isn't because faith can't answer, answer skepticism, but it's because we haven't really been serious about working through faith. And, and we haven't really honed the edges off of our faith, the dross, the things that maybe aren't that, that well thought through. And those are the things that the opponents will wrap us up in, the, the, the parts where we probably haven't thought through it very well anyways. And so this is one of the places where we can do that. We can start thinking through some things like that. In terms of application, you know, that's the um, sort of the bugaboo you always hear about, you know, tell them, tell them what they're going to do. Make them something, give it something practical for them to do on Monday. If that's what a sermon does, is just sort of telling people, here's the ethic that you live. But like I told you last week, I don't think that it should just be sort of uh, moralistic deism. You know, that, that, uh, that it's, it's therapeutic for the people. It helps them have better marriages. It helps them be a better employee. It's therapeutic for them because God in general uh, rewards good people who do good things. And so here's a good thing for you to do. I, I think that's a very dumbed down version and not even a real version of, of what a sermon ought to do or what we ought to be doing when we get together. No, what we're really trying to do is, is not just to, to sort of have the, here's what you gotta do on Monday, but um, we used to have an expression for this all the time, and I don't wanna use the expression because it, it sounds overly technical, but what we do depends on who we are. We act out of character, we act out of identity. But the trouble is, is that what we oftentimes teach is here's what you do, here's what you do, here's what you do. And so people may get the here's what you do, here's what you do, but they don't get who we are. And, and so what that means is then as soon as a decision has to be made where I haven't been told specifically what to do, now I don't know what to do. But if I know who I am, then I always know what I should do out of that character. I act out of character, not out of uh, just what is the specific rule here or there. And so if we can form our character to be Christ-like, then that doesn't necessarily mean that at the end of the lesson it's going to be, here's the one, two, three things that you take from this. 
but that the lesson instead is, do you see the image of who we're, we're following? Do you see God? Uh, do you see who Jesus is? And this is who we are. We're forming our character like him. And so at some point, uh, the character of Christ determines how we act to people. The character of Christ determines uh, how we make decisions. And that's the deeper level where it works. That's what Paul was getting at when he says, the person who loves is freed from the law. The person who loves is freed from the law because love is the fulfillment of the law. What he's saying there isn't that law doesn't matter and there aren't any ethics. What he's saying is once you really understand it, you're going to understand that love is the thing that really makes this thing work. And it's not just a matter of getting, you know, dotting the I's and crossing the T's. It's a, that's not just what it is. It's, it's, it's love behind all of these things that actually motivates all these things. So application, in other words, is really between the listener and God. Application is what happens as I'm living in my life and I'm aware more and more of who God is and, and what God's character is and understanding that he wants me to act in concert with that character. And so now um, my spirit, bearing witness with his spirit, Paul talks about in Romans 8, I begin to understand what it is that I need to do uh, to reflect the character of God. Okay, that's what we're really wanting to do when we're out in the world. We're wanting to reflect the character of God. And you can't reflect the character of God just with Betty Crocker's list of what to do. You reflect the character of God by taking on the character of God. Okay, so there's a tension in preaching and I let these things be. Uh, there's a tension between the transcendence of God and the eminence of God. God is high and holy. You know, God is holy, holy, holy. When In the year that the king Isaiah died, I saw the Lord of hosts sitting down in the temple. And his whole glory filled that. And the cherubim were going around him singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. And Isaiah says, I am undone because I'm a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. That's the transcendence of God. God is way holier than us. God is way better than us. He's just, he's just up in the clouds. But then there's the eminence of God. There's, there's Jesus teaching us to pray with our Father who aren't in heaven. It's, we're so used to that, we can't hear what a phrase that is. We're, we're so used to that. We, it, it, it probably doesn't strike us that if you read through the whole Hebrew Bible, you're not going to see God ever addressed as our Father. So he's, he's teaching an eminence there. And even when he uses the word Abba, which for us isn't too shocking, but that's daddy, you know, daddy father. And so that's a very, that's, that's a very uh, close thing. That's a very informal thing. And so you'll see that clash in people. There'll be the people that say, you know, you need to give your best to God, come and wear your best suit and do everything like that. That's sort of, you know, and they're very concerned with the transcendence of God. And then the other side is like, no, 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 you wear tennis shoes and blue jeans because Jesus came to be one of us, and this is what he is. But the thing is, the scripture does both of those things. Um, so so for, you know, for, the, for the suit wearers, if you will, it's be aware that Jesus teaches us to call God Daddy, and um, he walks around in our clothes and in our flesh. And then for the people that are very comfortable with that, it's like, well, be aware that God is the creator of the universe. And that, that he is holy and he's not to be trifled with. And yes, he has come down and he's made, ourself close to, 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 he's made himself close to us, but he's also still way above us. Well, the thing is, is some texts emphasize the transcendence and other texts emphasize the eminence. And so when you're in a text that emphasizes the transcendence, don't, don't ruin it by starting to talk about eminence. That, you know, that I'm not saying that, you know, that's, that doesn't need to, don't do that, don't do that. If the text is talking about the transcendence of God, if we're in Isaiah 6, that's not the place then to say that, you know, but understand that it's not all high and holy. There's also this and that. You know, these, these tensions in, in preaching, faith versus works. If you're in some places, they're really emphasizing the faith. In other places, they're really emphasizing the works. If you really hear both of those things, you could hear a contrast there. But can we talk about faith without worrying that somebody is mis getting it wrong? So the, the, the tension, we, we just, we have to let that go. Judgment versus consolation. Nobody talks about hell more than Jesus. In all of scripture, he's the one that talks about it the most. But we don't tend to think of that. The judgment kind of goes out the side and we end up a lot of times with only consolation. We want to have both. There's judgment and consolation. 
And so that, that tension just doesn't go away. And there's so many others. Uh, law and grace, um, Paul and James, just flat out how Paul writes, how James writes. Um, the church is, or the kingdom is here, but yet it's not here. The kingdom is here, but it is yet to arrive. Um, inclusion and exclusion. Jesus says, if you're not working against me, you know, he who is not against me is for me. But in another place, he says, if you're not working for me, then you're against me. And so it's, in one place, it's inclusion. In the other place, it's exclusion. And so if we're in the text that does inclusion, do inclusion. And if we're in the text that does exclusion, do exclusion. And yes, there's a tension there. There's, there, there might end up being the possibility of, um, of, of momentary misunderstanding. But I hope you can see that that's not, that's not fatal. Uh, momentary misunderstanding is not a problem. That's just something that we work with. That's, that's how God brings us through. Okay, that's kind of how I view this. Let me uh, go very quickly now with uh, the part of the audience. I am struck uh, as a listener, and I've probably listened to more sermons than I have given, I am struck at the responsibility of the listener. You know, God does put a lot onto the speaker. Uh, James, for instance, talks about don't be many teachers because teachers will receive the greater condemnation. But by the same token, it matters what we listen to and what we believe and what we do with it. The best example I know of this uh, comes from the chapter right before the one that uh, Chris was referring to, Jeremiah 29. The, you know, here's the hope that I have for you. But Jeremiah 28, before that, is the battle between Hananiah and Jeremiah. The battle between Hananiah and Jeremiah and it matters who the people believe. But here's the tough thing. Hananiah is pictured and described as a prophet of God. And so Hananiah comes as a prophet of God. Jeremiah has come along and Jeremiah has been saying, um, he, he's been saying, go to Babylon. God is punishing us by sending us to Babylon. Cooperate with this spanking and it won't be so bad. You ever done that with your kids? You know, don't fight me and it won't be so bad, right? Okay, and that's what God does. God says, I'm punishing you. I'm sending you to Babylon. I'm going to send you for 70 years. Don't fight Babylon when they come and don't go to Egypt for help. And, and, and you'll be 70 years and you'll come back. So what happened? The people ended up fighting Babylon. A whole bunch of them go down to Egypt for help. People went into captivity and, and they, they're still trickling back. Uh, they, they were there many more years than 70 years. Uh, in fact, a whole uh, congregation of them continued to live in northern Africa, uh, even, even to the time of the, of the early church, which is why uh, there were so many Christians in Alexandria, Egypt. So they didn't listen to God. But why didn't they listen? Because a prophet of God told them not to. Jeremiah said, don't fight the Babylonians and don't go to the Egyptians. Hananiah said, fight the Babylonians God doesn't want this. We're going to be just fine. And then Jeremiah says, I'll even put a number on them for you. 70 years. And he's got a yoke. He's got a wooden yoke that he does. Hananiah comes over and says, here's what God says. And he tears apart the wooden yoke. And he says, two years. Now, the people have to decide. How do you decide? How do you decide whether I'm listening to Jeremiah or whether you listen to Hananiah? This to me is the place where it's the hardest. There's some other places that we could talk about, but this to me is where I'm going like, wow, that would be tough. Because you imagine being in an assembly where a preacher that you respect says one thing and then another preacher that you respect gets up and says another thing. How would you decide? But see, they're still responsible for how they decide. They paid the consequences for believing the wrong one. But if they would think about it, it might have behooved them to sort of look closer at their own motivations. Anytime I find myself leaning more towards somebody that says, you know what, you're perfect as you are. You're, you're just right where you need to be. You are God's special child, his special project. And what you believe is completely right. And what you do is completely right. And everyone who disagrees with you is wrong, and I don't know why. I think they know they're wrong, they just want to be wrong. Okay? When you hear that sort of thing, something inside of you should say, wait a minute, why am I drawn to that? 
Why, why aren't instead, why aren't I drawn to something instead that stretches me, that challenges me, that says you're not everything that God wants you to be. There's some growing to be done. You don't have everything right. There's some learning to be done. Why, why, don't, I, why don't I relate to that more? See, Jeremiah comes bringing a message which, uh, which they would say he was not patriotic. And that, that's exactly what they said. They said, you're giving encouragement to the enemy about Jeremiah. And so it wasn't very easy to listen to Jeremiah. Jeremiah doesn't have the popular message. Hananiah does. Now, it's possible, and in this same text, Jeremiah acknowledges this. Jeremiah says, it's possible that somebody bringing you this very personal, um, you know, you're good as you are message, it's possible that that's true. If it ends up coming true, then you'll realize that it's true. But the, the thing that Jeremiah is making known there is, but we really ought to be skeptical of that. God typically doesn't send prophets to people to tell them that they're A-OK -okay right as they are. He typically sends prophets to people to tell them something that they need to know. Uh, there, there typically is a message that they need to hear. And so the responsibility is on me to not just sit and listen to all the areas where I want to shout amen and to just disregard those areas where it kind of challenges me and it doesn't really fit along with what I've always thought or with what I currently think. That's on me. No, no one else can do that for me. No, nobody else, the preacher can't do it for me. The preacher doesn't know everything that I'm thinking. My spirit deep inside of me knows what I'm thinking. And so I can sit and I can listen to a lesson and I can say, yeah, I don't have a problem with that. And the reason why is I don't struggle with that. That's good preaching, you know. But then when he starts saying something that maybe I really need to hear, but then the reaction at that point is to say, well, now he's gone to meddling, you know, or now I think he's just giving opinions. And, and in fact, as a listener, what we really ought to do, what I try to do when I'm in your position, is to listen for those things like, where did that stick a little bit? Where did that gouge because that might be something I need to think about because our first reaction most typically to to that sort of prophetic message is to reject it uh, that's just the human first reaction is to just reject it and so instead of just just wrapping myself all around all the stuff that I already agree with that's not necessarily going to bring any growth to really be open to say what is it that God wants me to do to continue to grow? Um, where is it that God would like for me to amend my ways or my views? And that's, that's something that is, uh, is a very difficult thing to do as a listener. I can tell you I know that. It is a difficult thing to do, but I think that's what we're called to. And so we're prayerful as we listen. We're expectantly listening. We're expecting that God's going to bring something to us. In this text that I read, I was reading about the Holy Spirit's part in this. And again, that you may not be comfortable with that sort of language, but just, just hang in there and just consider what I'm saying, because I think I've actually experienced this. Uh, I, I think I, I'm not just doing exegesis here. I think I'm also talking about experience. And this is, this is why I say that. I have presented lessons in the past and I have had all ranges of emotional reactions to it. I have had, I've presented lessons on baptism and had people at the end say to me, well, do you believe in it or not? I can't tell. And then I've had other people on that same lesson say, you really think that a person has to be baptized to be saved? Is that, is that really what you believe? Listen to how opposite those reactions are. Same words and look at those reactions. That's the that's where people are coming from. That's what they're hearing. That's what they're needing to hear. Um, somebody might be needing to hear, maybe you're looking at it as a magic act and you need to dial that back a bit. And somebody else might be coming to a place where they say, oh, that's just an optional thing they did 2,000 years ago. And maybe they need to be moving in a different direction off of that. And so the people are hearing it in different ways because of where they're positioned and, I believe, because of what the Spirit's doing with them at that particular moment. The Spirit knows where you are. I don't. The Spirit does. And so the Spirit can drive home a particular message. Um, the Spirit can make us understand things that perhaps we otherwise wouldn't have done. 
Uh, I believe that even this sermon today will work, you know, not because it's um, in any means a masterpiece. No, it's, it's hacked up to death, you know. I know it's snowing, and so I've been hacking, you know. But um, the Spirit will make it work. The Spirit will make it work among faithful people who want to be benefited, and they will be. Uh, if they want to be benefited by it, they will. Otherwise, no. But the Spirit will make it work, and so I'm, I'm not uncomfortable with that. I'm, I don't beat myself up anymore. I used to. Uh, it used to be my worst time of the week was always Sunday afternoons. I always so much was, oh, I should have said this, I should have said that. I don't really do that anymore because the Spirit's the one that's driving the message home. It's, it's not going to turn on whether I use the right phrase. It's, that's, that's, it's not going to turn on that. Okay, God has always chosen flesh and language to communicate. You know, he could just communicate to us in dreams or in skywriting or whatever, but he's always spoken through people. He's always used human language, and he continues to do that. He continues to, to use human language. And this, uh, as I mentioned before, all ranges of emotions that people will have, completely opposite reactions. And this is the most, uh, this is the one that really says it to me. Because you have to know, I never aim a sermon at anybody. Uh, I've never done that. I, even when I was young, I didn't think that a preacher should do that, and I didn't. But I can't tell you how many times somebody will say, were you talking to me? Were you talking to, right to me? Have you been reading my email? And, and no, I, I haven't. Now, what will happen is that human experience is kind of common, quite honestly. And so when I use a church experience, it may sound like something you just told me, but it's always from more than 10 years ago and always more than 300 miles away. So, so odds are you're never going to find where it actually came from, even though it may sound familiar. But we get messages. We hear things as if they're being spoken to us. Because God isn't passive in all of this. He's not passive in all of this. He's, he's active in all of this. And so we can get this message that comes from, from him. And so when people come and they say, did you aim that at me? I say, I didn't, but somebody else might have. <laughs> you know, seriously, I didn't. But maybe that's a message that the Spirit wants you to get. And then again, from experiential things, and this is just hard to, to convey, but times that a passage came clear to me in a pulpit, like I studied it and studied it and I still wouldn't get it and, and I'm doing the best I can with it. And then in the moment, in the preaching moment, I got it. I see what it is. I got it. It's clear. It's just one of those things that continues to say to me, God is involved here. By the way, uh, if you're from our tribe, Churches of Christ, if, that, if that's your heritage and this sounds a little strange to you, I want you to know that's because we change through the years. Uh, in fact, you'll still hear vestiges of this in our prayers. Uh, a lot of our prayers will say, if there's somebody here tonight who has not named your son as their savior, we pray that they will do so tonight. That prayer was offered with the belief that the spirit convicted the hearts of men. That's where that prayer came from. That, that used to be uh, the predominant view in our tribe. That has gone away from being the predominant view. Now it's like it's all about words on a page and, and logical and rhetorical argument. But, you know, that's, that's not what the text seems to say. The text seems to say that the Spirit is engaged in this communication and that we are going to hear what we need to hear if we're open to it and if we're asking for it. God, what do you want him to say to me? What do you want to say through him to me? Not to my neighbor, not to somebody else, but to me. And so the response I'm looking for, it's not to get you to be good people. I assume you already are. It's not to make you feel good, even we talked about that last week. It's not to entertain or fascinate or, you know, uh, titillate, you know. I, I, I know I heard a great sermon if I laughed, you know. I know I heard a great sermon if I cried. Um, it's, it's none of those things. It's none of those sort of manipulative things. It's not even to convince you to be a Christian, believe it or not. I'm not going to try to convince anybody to do that. Um, if somebody is a Christian because they hear the message, that's great. But I, I don't want to just argue somebody into doing it. What I would rather do and what I'm trying to do instead is to try to get us to see God and to see his perspective. And if we see God and if we see his perspective, we're going to be drawn to that. Remember the verse from last week. If I am lifted up, I will draw all people unto myself. That's what Jesus says. So it's not, you know, if I am lifted up and if you have airtight arguments. It's, it's not that. It's just lifting up Jesus. That's the draw. 
And so this will kind of do away with the, kind of the, what I call the Betty Crocker sermons. Um, you know, this, this subject made easy, that sort of thing. That doesn't really, that doesn't really work. Uh, it's a constant challenge instead to say, are we actually getting some insight into who God is? Uh, are, are, are we beginning to understand how he loves us and how he wants to bring us into his kingdom? Uh, are, are we having a sense of how God um, treats enemies and how therefore we ought to treat enemies how how God treats uh, brothers and sisters and therefore how we ought to treat brothers and sisters again not just in a one two three here's how you do it way but actually understanding um, who it is uh, and and acting out of the character of God and so to me the best thing you can do uh, absolutely as a listener is to cooperate with the Holy Spirit to cooperate with the Holy Spirit by saying what do you want me to learn? Not just while I read the scripture, but even while I'm here in this assembly. What do you want me to see? What do you want me to understand? And then to, to search for that, to listen for that closely, uh, to be open to that sort of thing and understanding that what that will do oftentimes is it won't just leave me where I am. It won't be just confirmation. It may also be a challenge. But it will also be something which, if I embrace it, it's going to be joyful. And it's, it's going to be worth it. You know, the, every message from God, it is, in the beginning, oftentimes bitter. But eventually it leads to joy. Eventually it brings us to where he wants us to be. And that's, that's top to bottom. That's, that's top to bottom. That's what God's word does. It, it brings us to him. And it forms us as a people. Uh, that's, that's why I think there's actually something uh, important about hearing things at the same time. I'm old-fashioned there, but don't just tape them and listen to them at various times through the week. Hear it at the same time. Be in the same audience together. See and impact each other. Kind of hear each other's ruminations and maybe even sort of chat with each other afterwards. It's a community event is the whole point. It's a community event. Okay. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. I think we're singing an invitation song, and uh, uh, that is a time if you want to make a public response, we encourage you to do that while we stand up. If we are walking in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. If we are walking to con willing to confess our own unrighteousness, he will wash away all our transgressions. If we are walking in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. If we are willing to confess our own unrighteousness, he will wash away all our transgressions. We have fellowship with one another.